Here we are with the second movement of the Telemann E minor. Fair warning, you will need a pencil. What a lot of notes. Let's just dive straight in, shall we? At a sensible interpretation of the marking allegro. <laughs> Straight away, you will notice I have totally ignored one of the bowing marks in the third bar. I've ignored the first slur because it just messes everything up. If you slur this, you're backwards for ever. So I've just taken it out. fingering decisions along the way. For quite a lot of that, there isn't an awful lot of choice. You plant yourself in first position and it just kind of goes one finger per note. There are lots of places where it's good to hold fingers down. So I think one of the things that you have to think about in here is that there's a melodic element to it, obviously, but quite often you have to have the harmonic structure in mind as well. And there's a lot of places where you look at a bar and you think, okay, well, it's a, it's a nice tune, but actually it's just outlining a particular chord. And it's a great opportunity then for leaving fingers down on other strings. So you can have whole chords ringing and resonating within the instrument. So every opportunity you can to leave fingers down on the left hand. There's a couple of slightly awkward corners though, aren't there? Let's go from bar 10. I think you need a three on this. So you have enough fingers to play a three on the G, a two on the B. I would move the three at the absolute last minute. Hold it as long as you dare. Move it up here. Don't take the two off though. sense. So I've brought my three over, kept it, one for the D sharp, and I've still got my two down on that B, and the one is now free to move over here in bar 12 and play the F sharp at the bottom, and I haven't taken the three off the top on the E, so it's still there. Now you can do what you like, can't you? One on the D at the bottom in 14. And I still have a three on the top from the previous bar. So I played 12, uh, 13, sorry. Chordal fingering the G to the C. And I never let the C go here. And I never let the D go at the bottom. So lots of these notes that I'm coming back to got fingers already there. So although it's quite hoppy, actually with the left hand not working quite as hard as it might look as though you should be. Should I just do that again? That's 13. I'm in first position. Holding the C down and adding the D at the bottom. Holding the D and coming back to it. Let's stop there a second. Bowing wise, it's lots and lots of this. It's a crotchet quaver effectively in all this stuff. Paint some shapes so that not all of your crotchets are the same length. Don't panic about travelling a little bit along the bow, but it's going to be really unhelpful if we travel a long way. You can't let that happen, can you? Because if we get stuck at the heel, there's just nowhere to get back. So you've got to watch it a little bit. Very far, so you do need to try and keep yourself in the top bit of the bow. 
but look out for snatching the quaver because you're worried about getting back to the tip. You're just going to have to play about with that and work out exactly how much recovering you need to do, how far are you allowed to travel down the bow, how much pressure can you take off in the little quaver at the end so that it doesn't stick out. Lots of things to think about. Shall we play it but nice and steadily? So we'll try one and two. <laughs> place to um, reach. If you have an octave fret that's very helpful. If you have a curly pattern on your vial that can be very helpful. If you have neither of those things, good luck. Let's have a look. From bar 16 we got as far as the bottom D. Here's a bit where we're thinking harmonically. I would put a four on that D. And then I'd start the shift, you don't need to go D on that G, but I think there's something about being on the way to that top B. And to find the B, I am going for the top fret with my second finger, and then I know where the B is underneath it. So I've gone, made the move, aimed for my second finger on the top and put the four down, put a four on this, in there is there and again let's make the move second finger on the top fret as a guide now what are we going to do in a way it would be quite nice to move after the top note but what are we going to do after that it's just a bit awkward isn't it so I think what I would do is stay for one more note, play the C up there, move to a four on the B, and you've got the first three quavers of bar 25 then in one position. So your second finger is anchored happily on that top fret, you know where the B is, you have to reach back a bit to find the G, open string, and here we are, down and ready to carry on. So I think that's my preferred fingering in there. Stay where you are. Effectively move your two onto the top fret. Shall we go from the last quaver of 16? Nice and steady. One and two. <laughs> deliberately quite slow hoping that you might have a chance to just catch some of the fingering but I'll go through it. So I'm going from the last quaver of 26. We came down conveniently in 25 so here we are in first position ready to go. Move back for the A sharp. 
And this is the bar, 29, that causes problems. You've got a few choices. You could say, I need three notes on the same fret on three different strings. I'll just employ three different fingers. I think that's definitely possible. And then you'll have to move one of them over to play the A sharp. But I do, I find it a little bit squashed. And I think because of where you come from before it, and where you're heading, needing a bit of space behind those three fingers, I just find that a bit of a squish. So I think what I've gone for as a preference is to bar the first two notes. This is 29. And I'm barring the D to the F sharp. And then putting a two for the B. And then I've got a bit more space find the A sharp at the end. And now I'm in half position, keeping the two on the B. You just come back to it at the end of 30. Same again here, let's bar the D to the F sharp, two on the B, and we're in a half position, which is useful for this D sharp. Move your one up. Now you just need one more finger than you actually have. We're going to move a one onto the F sharp, a whole tone to the G sharp, a whole tone to the A sharp. It is quite a stretch. I don't have a better idea. I think one of the most important things there is that you take your thumb with you. If you put a one on that F sharp and your thumb is sort of behind your second finger, the problem is you're just never going to reach that far with the rest of it. So you need for your thumb to come with your second finger. It's a real stretch that. It's sort of harder in slow motion because when you do it, there's a bit of momentum going as you get there and it does make the stretch a little bit easier. But I don't have a better solution for that bar, I don't think. That's 34. And then you've got to jump. Having got there, it's fine. Take a breath and finish off with a kind of comment at the end of the, of, of the section. So I think it's all right once you've got there to just leap. Let's do some of that, shall we? Where's a good bar to go from? We'll go from the last quaver of 26. The last quaver of 26. Nice and steady, and I'll try and talk you through it as we go. So one and two. Going back. Bar. Two. Bar. Two. Stay in half. Moving up. Good luck. So I hope you got all of that. Shall we play the whole of that first section from the top, nice and steady? Here we go. One and two. Get right back to the tip. going. Shall we go on to the second section? 
couple of fingering things straight away. How oh, about a four for this D? And a four for this F sharp. Go for your second finger on the top fret. We'll take this slur out, or at least I think it's worth taking it out, just like we did at the beginning. Just the first one, take it out, and then do the bowing that's printed. Fingering wise, there are loads of options in here. You could try several and see what you think. My preference is to move back with a one onto the F sharp in the middle of 39. Come across the string and come down on the B. There are any number of ways you might play that bit, but that's what, what I've settled on. Feel free to try some others out. And as ever, just once you've tried them all, pick one, write it in, and then just learn with that option. And don't get there and make a different decision each time you do it. So this is from the top B. I came back, one on the F sharp, four across, one on the B. And now we're set for this next bit. So I've set us up in the middle of 40 to begin that bit. Should we play from the double bar? One, two. a huge number of choices in here you need to just stay in first position there are a few options of four fingers and open strings some of that is going to come down to personal taste so I'm looking in the middle of 40 <laughs> on that B hasn't moved for quite some time. It went down in the middle of 40 and it's still there and it's still there and it's still there. It's gone back down and it's still there and it's still there. It's not so bad that passage is it, it's just a bit nippy with the bow, you have to decide exactly how many notes there are on each string before you cross, and whether you cross in the middle of a slur or whether you've got two notes on the same string. It's the sort of passage where it would be worth doing it obviously to work out the left hand fingering, but then it would be worth doing it without your left hand and actually seeing whether or not your bow knows which string it's going to be on at each moment. So how, what do I mean? I mean from the middle of 40 the middle of the bar, so where the B starts. If we bowed that, the first crotchet, if you're going to use a four, both of those notes in the slur are on the same string. The last note in the bar is also on the same string. The next two notes are on the same string. The G sharp is on the E string. The E to the G sharp is on the E string. The B is on the A string. The G sharp is on the E string, and you have to slur across the string. So the first three quavers of 42 are on three different strings, but once you get to the top string you stay there for the rest of the bar. The next three quavers are on different strings, the next two are on the same string, and the last one changes. So what I'm doing is practicing teaching this thing, whether it's absolutely sure which string it's on because moments of indecision in those sorts of passages where you get a kind of pattern going and you think, oh yeah, I know how this goes. It's one note on this string, one note on this string, one note on this string, and then three at the top. And then you get to a bar and it doesn't do that. And if you're not really, really certain, it's where you get all that untidy double stopping and things along the way. So right hand only practice for passages like that is really, really helpful. And you get a, a really funny idea of the, the melodic shape, but you discover things like, four or five quavers in a row that are on the same string and what you see on the page is a pattern that does this but what your bow is doing is playing all on one string so it's really quite revealing to take the left hand out. Why don't we play together both hands in from the middle of 40, the middle of 40. So two, one. <laughs> That is what 
such a good note. The first note of 50 and the interval. It's brilliant. Just a quick thing about bowing in 46. We end up on a forward bow here. We end up on another forward bow here. But it's okay because we can come back on this one. Don't come too far though because all of this bar is also on the back bow so you need to make sure you've got enough left. So effectively 46 and 47 are two very very long forward bow bars but then 48 and 49 are conveniently two very long back bow bars but just don't don't get there too soon. If you play 46 and you get right to the heel 47 is going to be very very difficult and if you play 48 and you think oh thank goodness for that and get back to the tip 49 is going to be very difficult so just distribute your bow really carefully should we try it this is 46 just from a bow management point of view one two one two don't travel too far on the way back Save a bit. Two on the D at the bottom, one on the D sharp. Absolutely hold the two down here so you get maximum resonance over that interval. I'm going to go on and I'm going to go up here. It's all of that very nicely on one string it's just a bit untidy over there so we're going to go up here reach back for a one on the G and come down half position so you've got a finger left for the C sharp did that make sense that's the end of 54 and I'm up on the top fret I'm reaching back for the G, open A string, half position because of the C sharp, quite like that on a four, and finishing there. We'll go on a second, this is a four because of the D sharp, hold the F down, so your full finger once it goes down on that F sharp, here, stays there. I'm not sure there's much choice in there, is there 16? Actually, it's nice to be in first position here. Put the A with a 4, bar the 1. Let's just play that much. This is the end of 54. 1, 2. equivalent of stopping up there isn't it earlier on so we've got a few things to think about in here this is the last quaver of 62 now I wasn't ready for this last time but I think it's useful if at the end of 64 the finger that's playing the B is barring across to the F sharp at the start of 65. That's going to be useful for the whole of 65. But then, now there's a choice to make here. There are two possibilities for the D sharp in 66. One is that we stay in first position with that bar and we stick out our fourth finger and find the D sharp up here. It's quite nice as a fingering, just having your hand in first position creep up for the D sharp and stay there.
it just breaks the pattern of the top note always being on a higher string so you get the top of this at 65 on the higher string the higher string again and then it's a bit of an anti-climax for that one to be on the string that you were on all along and then the top one gets that pattern of, of being on the higher string so it might be better at 65 the bar for that long but then how about a two at the end of the bar and then we get the D sharp on the brighter top string on the way up to the F sharp there I quite like that pattern I think so the high notes are always on a higher string going on the same thing happens Now here again we've got the same choice of finding the D sharp there or in 68 coming back and playing with F sharp with a 4 having the 1 left for the D sharp I like the D sharp back here but I much prefer making the shift from first position rather than half. So, six of one, half a dozen of the other. Try them out and see what you think. I've opted to go there because my strike rate is just rather more accurate. But I do slightly miss having the D sharp there and those being on different strings. So take your pick. Let's go from the end of 62. The B at the end of 62. One and two. Get the bar ready. shift at the same time. We could come right the way down here, couldn't we? I've added a slur to this next pair. So we're back at the tip and we're the right way round. there is really about the fingering in there either. Once you're here, fall on this. You could either wiggle back with a one or play with C natural with a three. Either is fine. G sharp with a three so you can play this A on a four. Put that D sharp on a two because it fits very nicely to be in first position in 76. So wherever you've been before it, end of 75, let's have that D sharp on a second finger. And this one. just to practice coming down one two That's helpful. 
shall we play the second section? All of it, still at a nice sensible speed from the double bar. One and two. <laughs> So that is all of the fingering potentially perfected, most of the bowing thought about just by adding a couple of extra slurs to help us out along the way. The next thing you need to think about, and I'm going to leave you to think about it, particularly as it gets quicker, is how to not make it sound like a steam train, just kind of chugging along. Getting into a good rhythm and just sort of chugging along nicely. There are ways of, of painting shapes. doing it slightly but you get the idea that not all of it is going to go you might get the odd so don't be afraid of just going with some of the highs and lows and just getting bits where you're very nice about it and then others where there's interesting things happening Draw them out a bit so that you don't just get stuck in this. Baseline coming up. <laughs> 